Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Gordon Feller. I'm here in Silicon Valley, California, and I'm joined today by John Jefferson. I'll introduce him in a moment. Let me introduce myself. I'm the moderator and convener of today's webinar. Thank you for having time with us today. We'll be recording this, so you'll see it live, but you'll also have a chance to access this on the, the same YouTube link, and we'll, we'll, we will tweet uh, the link and any updated information for you, both during this one-hour session today, but also in the days that follow. Um, I'm based in Meeting of the Minds, which is a nonprofit organization where I serve on the board of directors with John Jefferson and with some other colleagues. And my role at Meeting of the Minds as board member is, among other things, to help convene some of these types of programs with partners. And the World Smart City Forum is one of those partners. Let me tell you a little bit about World Smart City Forum. This is the result of a partnership linking three international agencies, uh, all of them based in Geneva. The International Electrotechnical Commission as uh, an international organization that brings together utilities, both public utilities and private utilities, and others, including and especially national governments and the agencies of those national governments that worry about global standards and technical standards. And they're all focused together at the IEC on the, the energy future for our planet. They're joined by two partner organizations, the International Standards Organization, otherwise known as ISO, uh, which, as I said, is also based in Geneva. And this is a UN agency which is focused on creating and nurturing and supporting the um, emerging global standards, especially around technologies. And we'll be talking about some of those opportunities for creating new standards today. And then the third partner in the World Smart City Forum is the International Telecommunications Union. Uh, which is the organization behind the scenes that makes it possible for all of the telecom operators like AT&T around the world to be able to know which parts of the spectrum they can use, when they can use them, how they can use them, and all of the other variety of issues that uh, global telecom and national and local telecom organizations care deeply about. So these three organizations came together uh, more than two years ago to really pursue the smart city agenda in a, in a unique way. And one of the ways that the World Smart City Forum does this is convening these webinars, these Google Hangouts. And we're really pleased today to have John Jefferson here. He's the Director of Statewide Constituency Relations at AT&T in California. Uh, he's sitting in an office not too far from where I am today. Uh, in his role there at AT&T, he's responsible for the development and execution of strategies that lead to coalition building and helping to manage on a statewide basis in California the vital relationships that AT&T has with nonprofits like Meeting of the Minds, with state government agencies, and with a variety of others, including municipalities. And as we're going to hear today, organizations focused on agriculture and water. Uh, his own focus at AT&T is on building strong ties to key influencers in a variety of, of segments of the telecom industry, including the rural segment and agriculture, public safety and environment. But he's also partnering with government organizations, consumer organizations, and business organizations to create a new kind of customer service that he calls effortless customer service really to accelerate opportunities for AT&T and for AT&T's partners. So, John, thanks again for being with us today. Uh, we followed your tweets at AT Tech Innovate with a, with a number eight, and we'll we'll let people know how they can find you when we tweet during the course of the hour. But we we have John today joining us because we thought it would be very interesting, especially after last week's program. I'm sorry, last month's program to have John talk about the food supply chain and how the rural communities that are uh, the, the breadbasket for urban communities are discovering and nurturing new technology opportunities and what the linkage between rural and urban might look like in the coming years. Uh, so John, I don't want to steal any more of your thunder. Uh, we'll have questions streaming in from our participants, and I'll be tracking those with our producer, Sylvia. Thank you for Sylvia and your support in London for us today. So John, I offer you the floor, and please take it away, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Gordon. I uh, appreciate it, and that was a great introduction. Uh, thanks for this opportunity, and uh, thank you listening 
uh, and viewing audience for your participation today. Um, I've had a 20 year career, 20 plus year career at AT&T, and I've seen uh, quite a bit of change in those 20 years. Uh, I originally joined the company because uh, in the mid 90s, uh, one could see the amount of data um, being processed. I had an internship at IBM. Uh, in between uh, the two years I was uh, doing my MBA program, and uh, seeing the amount of data that was being processed, but also thinking about how that data was going to be moved around to um, create what what we have today in terms of the uh, databases and the and the um, and the and the systems that that process that data into information that is useful for all kinds of purposes. Uh, I said, what what companies will be transporting that data? And at the time, Pacific Bell was one of those companies, and uh, I joined I joined them, and they eventually became uh, AT and T through uh, all of the mergers that, that transpired over the next uh, ten to fifteen years. Uh, that that kind of brings us to the the present, where uh, we have this company that's focused on connecting everyone in the world. Um, and doing it better than anyone else. That's, that's sort of our tagline. And, and working with this company um, in California over the last five years, located in Silicon Valley, but as Gordon said, having responsibilities also in the Central Valley, San Joaquin Valley, and, and Salinas Valley, working with rural uh, constituents, I, I saw the challenge of uh, a different kind of connectivity, and that was connecting the two the two valleys, if you will, as a, as a metaphor, uh, the Silicon Valley and I'll just say the cent Central Valley, or where the food's being grown, uh, from a technology perspective. And in 2014, uh, Gordon and I put together, um, along with a couple of other stakeholders, a a discussion of experts around technology, water technology, precision agriculture technology, and some of the technology that was uh, happening in the valley being developed, uh, sensor technology, IoT technology, to have a discussion about how can we alleviate some of the problems being caused by the drought in California through technology. And one of the big challenges, of course, as you push out to the edge of networks is getting data and getting information back from remote locations where there isn't a lot of uh, wireless or, or uh, wireline broadband uh, connectivity. Uh, so we had that discussion, we had that meeting, and since then there's been an explosion of activity in this area where more and more conferences are being held, more and more discussions are being held, more and more incubators are cropping up. Uh, companies that are looking into this very issue of how do we bring technology to where our food is being grown so we can optimize productivity and reduce uh, resource consumption, especially resources like water. There's also the idea that um, fertilizers and other things that are used, uh, techniques that are used to uh, herbicides that are used to uh, improve uh, outcomes in growing and production of food are also impacting our water system, our groundwater system, and our surface water. So uh, as we've had these discussions, it's led me to continue to make those ties between you know, the, the companies that process data and the companies that move that data around, and the companies that collect that data through devices and platforms. And so when, when we talk about the value chain of from, from the farm to the fork, if you will, uh, all of these issues come into play. And I've seen uh, AT&T, as well as many other companies, right in the center of this discussion on how do we get uh, food to feed uh, not just a growing population in the United States, but a growing world population, which, as everyone's heard the estimates, 9 billion people 
by 2050 have to be fed um, with less resources in terms of clean, fresh water available, also land availability as people, um, as the population increases. And then finding increasingly cut off, you know, cities that are increasingly cut off um, from the outlying areas, from the, from the rural areas as, as densification increases and transportation and other systems begin to get strained. So it's not just even the challenge of moving the data, it's also the challenge of moving food. And I'll kind of um, end my uh, initial comments by saying some of what I've been looking at recently um, and, and have been really fascinated by is the idea of taking that uh, farm to fork um, value chain and compressing it, if you will, such that we bring ourselves back to a point where we're looking at food, pro food production within the boundaries of the city. And that's that we see with um, companies like Aero Farms bringing uh, production to uh, warehouses, vertical farms inside of city centers, and also rooftop gardens uh, being transformed into rooftop farms. And those are just a couple of things with uh, hydroponics and aeroponics we see. And there's still that demand, though, to collect data more even more, precise, more precisely so that we can have uh, production in these indoor environments. They eliminate a lot of problems um, because uh, a closed indoor environment isn't going to have the same challenges around having to use uh, herbicides and pesticides. Uh, we also have a reduction in the, in the challenges in terms of transportation. But having uh, understanding the demand for that food, how, how to get it from where it's being produced uh, to, the, to the right place at the right time, whether it's a home or restaurant, those are all data intensive exercises. And it's going to open up a whole new realm of what I would call, you know, fresh to fork uh, production, meaning people using, getting their food on demand from places where it's being grown locally. So I'll, I'll stop there, but that, that's kind of the, the big picture of how I see um, the, the coming together of technology, um, rural, environmental issues um, to solve problems for people in cities. And where I see that the smart farm or the smart food production is going to meet the smart city and its inhabitants and start meeting some of their needs in truly unique ways and maybe solve this problem or, or go a long way towards solving this problem of feeding 9 billion people in a, in a world in 2050. Thanks for that opening, John. That leads to a whole lot of questions that we'll get into, and, and we'll also be able to field questions from our, our audience. But let's go back in time to maybe look backwards at the history of urbanization, where there was always a direct connection between the city and the agricultural communities located in, in, the, in the, rural, uh, the rural geographies that were not cities. And uh, you look back at the history, you know, of New York City, you know, very dense, very urbanized environment. And uh, when I grew up there in the 1960s, there were still some farms scattered around the city, although mostly uh, it was around Manhattan and the other boroughs. Um, but it also was in Manhattan in the early stages of the development of Manhattan Island, where you had a rapid urbanization taking place, but you still had a, a farming community. Um, now, of course, the connections are not just physical, but they're digital, and that makes it possible to, you know, reimagine the relationship between urban and rural. But the good news, I guess, and you can you can maybe talk to this, is a, is that the emerging technologies, 3G, 4G, 5G, LoRa, other technologies that we can talk about, uh, and especially small cell technology makes it possible for both the urban and the rural communities to have a common infrastructure, common digital infrastructure, common data framework. And I'm hoping that maybe you can talk a little bit about where AT&T is in this process and whether or how you think this is evolving fast enough. Uh, and if it is evolving fast enough, you know, what direction is it evolving in? 
Uh, sure. I'll, I'll start off with sort of a conceptual statement that I heard uh, at a conference uh, in Mountain View uh, when I first got to the Valley about five years ago. And the speaker said that every business is a software business. And I thought that was really interesting. It also challenged me uh, to really think, is that true? And I see that becoming more and more true now. Um, I didn't have the eyes of a programmer back then. But we're incredibly dependent on technology because software is driving every business. It's actually <laughs> driving uh, telecommunications. You mentioned the different technologies that connect uh, rural to urban and within urban and suburban environments, connecting people and machines uh, to each other. Uh, but that that's actually true uh, for for every business, and 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 it's also true in terms of uh, being software driven. It's even true for those connections. Uh, AT and T has adopted software defined networks and network function virtualization as ways to, to virtualize our network, make it more flexible and adaptable to make those communications connections between, as I said, uh, between machines and between human beings. And that even comes into play with something as visceral as growing food. And, it, and, 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 and you would think like, how can a farm be uh, or any kind of food production environment um, be a software driven environment well it's happening that's what the smart farm is um, and then to take your idea so I'm, I'm bringing together a couple of ideas here but I think it's it's important to, uh, to note that by 2020 and this was a study um, by Cisco there's going to be 13.7 um, billion machine to machine uh, connections uh, worldwide. And there's al already to, in, in 2016, 5.8 billion connections. Those are machines talking to machines through the connectivity you mentioned that companies like AT&T provide, um, but also through software and software uh, driven uh, connections and communications. That that is is part of the whole schema of what they estimate to be 50 billion up to 50 billion. That's a large estimate, um, but 50 billion IoT connections by 2020. What does that mean for the for the for the food value chain that we've been talking about? Well, information from someone who has demand for food will go to uh, two sources. One, it might go to a restaurant to get you uh, the order that you brought, but it also will go from that restaurant or from uh, to a wholesaler, from that wholesaler to uh, a food production uh, company, a, a middleman that transports, a middleman or a middlewoman that transports food. That'll go to um, a, a, a company that produces that food. Maybe it's a a, a company that makes strawberries or that produces lettuce, uh, fresh foods, um, hand-picked foods from fields in somewhere in the Central Valley or Salinas Valley of California. That kind of data going back and forth is, is all part of a software environment riding on a physical network. Now, you mentioned New York, say, in the 1800s. Uh, downtown Manhattan was the city. And uptown at Columbia University, where you went to school, um, would have been surrounded by fields and farms. And there was a communication system back then to tell people when to, um, that, that might tell people when to harvest. But sometimes that was just done on the, the rhythms of nature and the food would come when it came. But now, uh, as I mentioned, they're growing environments where that can be done much more so on demand. And Building out more robust networks is one thing that AT&T has been doing, um, not relying just on the terrestrial ne networks, but also uh, having seen increasingly people move to wireless communications, building out our wireless networks and evolving them from 3G, where we first saw 
in the uh, earlier part of this millennia, we, we saw people using, um, starting to use it for uh, their wireless phones more and more for data communications and accessing the internet. And now we see all manner of transactions as well as, um, um, as, as, well as voice communications. And even now, video, which is the number one consumer of the data on our networks being used. So we're seeing an evolution in, in, in all of these regards, but it all is coming back to software, uh, software-driven communications, and then networks that carry the data that's produced by them. And so you're seeing an acceleration of this adoption curve, which is good news because we, we want to see the process accelerating as rapidly as possible to get as much of this connectivity and technology integration in the rural environment as much as we've had in the urban. Uh, are there some big impediments that you want to highlight? I mean, the obvious impediment, of course, is resistance to adoption, uh, which, of course, takes time. People, people will adopt technology at their own pace uh, based on what they believe their own needs or their own interests are. Uh, but apart from the you know, human resistance to adopting the new, are there some big challenges or obstacles that you think we have to get focused on that if we could relieve those obstacles, if we could blow them up, uh, that we would see a more rapid acceleration, a more rapid evolution toward that goal of having the smart connected agricultural uh, field, whether it's a farm field or a ranch field? Is there something that you would want to highlight, maybe several some things that you would want to highlight that stand out as, as big uh, big problems that we all should get our heads around and think creatively about solving or at least uh, avoiding those obstacles? Well, I, I think that I think that the biggest the biggest challenge is people um, and and businesses understanding and being comfortable with data and and the difference between uh, data that identifies who they are, where they are, what they're doing, um, and data that treats them uh, more at an abstract level as an entity performing certain functions and activities. And I would call that um, anonymized data versus personalized data. And the important thing for a lot of these uh, processes that reveal information um, to help better decision making in in managers of uh, processes like moving food from one place to another or de making decisions about growing food um, or people in cities making decisions about ordering food and what kind of menu they can build uh, that data can be anonymized at an aggregate level and based on um, patterns of consumption by people like you and you and me, without letting them know that you had a, a cheese sandwich for lunch, um, they can just know that there was some bread consumed, some cheese consumed, and some energy consumed, um, and that fits into a, a chain of uh, behaviors and patterns from thousands and thousands of people in a city, which can give us interesting information about um, supply and demand. And, and that anonymized data is very valuable. And if people are comfortable with the fact that that, that type of data can be um, abstracted from their pattern, um, behavior patterns and, and usage patterns without any infringement on their privacy, then we'll go a long way because the technology is there and the infrastructure is being built. Um, we just need the information, the data to um, to work with. So, is there, in your view, a ideal scenario where government plays a constructive role in helping to enable, for instance, the rollout of some of the emerging technologies that will be critical to the success of rural connectivity for farmers and ranchers and those that supply them? 
In other words, uh, would you put your finger on one or two or three things that government can constructively do? Maybe one of them is getting out of the way in a specific specific sense of, of, of a specific manner, but maybe there are proactive as well as uh, non-active roles that government can play at the state level or the local level or at the national level uh, that you think we should highlight here that would make those emerging technologies succeed faster and better and maybe be more accessible and more affordable for the end user? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting and challenging question, um, especially from the perspective of uh, being in the United States, uh, a, a, comp a, a country that has um, has is is seen as a you know it's a, as a capitalist co a country where the government is is there, but that many of the the innovations, many of the um, advancements are are made um, with the private sector and the help of the government. Um, as opposed to maybe the other way around. So if you look at many times the U.S. and and our networks and and uh, the networks in 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 uh, Europe, I should say, uh, they're compared and and they say how how um, Europe has been so so far advanced in terms of building out uh, networks and the ubiquity of wireless communications, for example. Um, but the interesting thing is that average revenue per customer and the use of data in the U.S. is far greater than that of Europe, even though uh, Europe is, um, and, and they're catching up, of course, but um, even though their, their networks are more ubiquitous. So there's, there's different models in play, and, and we certainly in the U.S. have to struggle a little bit more because um, we have the private sector and we have the public sector, and the public sector um, you know, government regulates the private sector, and at least in, in part, um, uh, in terms of communications. So, aspect of the government um, helping by uh, having a level playing field for companies that are, are building out uh, networks and making sure that everyone has the same ability to use public rights away and to build out networks based on, you know, um, conditions set out that, that say, you know, you must consider, you know, cities have the right or, or states have the right to, um, you know, determine time, manner, and place of, of construction, but then allowing those networks to be built. And then, and then also having uh, innovation be a, a partnership so that um, everyone's working toward helping advance the next generation of communication that's going to enable all of this and 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 those partnerships will extend and must extend beyond just individual countries or even regions like the uh, economic regions like the the European Union they they, they need to be considered uh, on a global scale because these networks are no longer um, isolated by PTT or, you know, with, with an undersea or uh, connection. We're, we're literally all part of one big worldwide network. So um, that's, that's a place where government can be a uh, convening uh, force to help with standards and um, communication um, regulations that, aid and, and abet the, the free flow of information and communication. And so you're now um, obviously looking at California, which is a major supplier of ag to the world. I think, uh, you know, the more produce from California feeds the world than any other of the 50 states in the union. And, and a lot of other countries are dwarfed by the total volume of California agricultural output and export. Uh, one of the questions that's come across is about examples that you think are useful illustrations of a smart farm or a smart farming project that maybe you've had a chance to learn about and would share a little bit of the description of what, how it works at that particular location for that particular farm or that particular ranch, maybe one element of their technology story that you think is worth highlighting here. Um, I... 
I had the had the opportunity to uh, visit Russell Ranch on the UC UC Davis um, um, campus, if you will, the extended UC Davis campus, and that's a um, a test bed for uh, sustainable technologies. Um, and what I was what I was most impressed with, uh, and and you can go online and 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 um, and find out about about this this project that's being run. It's it's been in place um, for for several years now, and they they have the people that are running it are actual farmers. Um, the researchers are there, the scientists are there, the ag students are there, but they have hands-on uh, farmers running that that operation. And and what I what I found very fascinating was that. They they cut the the land up into segments, and they'll be working in parallel on different technologies, different sustainability technologies in different sections. So they might be doing uh, a soil moisture sensor um, analysis and and regulating the amount of water crops get um, to produce maximum output in one section, and then in another section of the of the ranch they're they're working on evapotranspiration sensors and determining um how much how much you know water is needed by how much is escape escaping uh they'll be working on uh fertilizers and and precision uh using using technology to um to uh identify weeds uh, versus the crop that you want to <laughs> to grow, which can sometimes look very much alike. Nature has found a way to do that, and the weeds sometimes emulate the uh, productive crops. And and so with uh, sensor technology, you can determine which is a weed and which isn't, and apply the herbicide in a in a um, uh, in a precise in a precise way to only kill the weeds and not oversaturate the soil. So um, that's one example of, of many where uh, some great things are being done um, on farms that are, are using technology. Another one is Tomcat Ranch. I won't go into the specifics about that, but that's another uh, uh, great operation in, in, uh, here in Northern California and Pescadero to look at. Yeah, and those who are interested in the Tomcat Ranch uh, might be interested to know that the uh, the the, the father mother pair, Tom and Cat, uh, husband wife team, have been very active around uh, renewable energy and energy accessibility on a global scale, not just in California. Although a lot of their uh, political campaigning around uh, clean energy has been California centric. I mentioned that because the International Electrotechnical Commission, the convener of the World Smart City Forum here today, uh, had a conference recently in Nairobi where they discussed the accessibility of energy in the global south in the developing countries. So let me ask you, you know, for those countries that are, are uh, particularly interested in low voltage direct current, in other words, renewables that are off grid, um, you know, what are the prospects for smart farming in countries like African countries where access to technology is limited? And I know, John, you've had a history of working in Africa as a volunteer, so you're familiar with some of the harsh realities, not just uh, climactic realities, but the access to resource technology being only one of those resources and the challenges that come with that accessibility problem. Can you talk a little bit about how the energy and the connectivity potentially converge, uh, for instance, around moving water from point to point? Um, you know, the, the, the big challenge in uh, East Africa, where I've spent most of my uh, time, uh, is, is uh, infrastructure. Um, plenty of energy from the sun and, plenty, and, and close to the equator, uh, but uh, and, and even the availability of uh, solar panels um, and renewable forms of energy um, from from moving water even uh, are possible, but there's there's in many of the rural locations there's limited uh, infrastructure in terms of a power grid. Um, another huge problem and challenge with with energy is storage. Um, of course, with 
the benefit of having a, a, a climate in the in the in the global south, as you described, where there's a lot of sunlight, there's also a lot of heat, and that wreaks havoc on batteries, which are the primary vehicles for storing energy. So, so those challenges uh, have to be met. Um, and there, in the foreseeable future, as as you talked about, in in terms of communications, um, you know, the role of government. Uh, I see a, a a big role of uh, a, a, for government in places like uh, the, the sub-Saharan African co um, countries um, to come in and and help get that infrastructure built, um, and then in, since it for energy and since it's a uh, in many places a greenfield opportunity, a new opportunity, uh, build smart. Um, grids and smart infrastructure, um, not starting out like we have in uh, some of the more advanced countries and then having to convert over, they can start afresh. And I do see uh, a lot of that uh, activity where um, smart smart farming being introduced in, um, in, the, in the African countries goes along with smart energy and clean energy. And they've always, from a sustainability perspective, except for maybe the the, the burning of fields and 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 um, and ag waste, uh, have been very sustainable in their operations. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out: a technology that we sometimes don't think about, but a, a, a very um, kind of acute anecdote now, as we're as as you know, seventy percent of the world's population is using smartphones. Um, in developed countries, uh, text to market uh, technology, whereby a farmer in a rural area in East Africa can receive a text message when uh, the crop that he or she is growing is in short supply in the market. It takes them a day or two to get to market. They get their crop there. They get much more for their crop because the demand is high because somebody let them know that those beans or potatoes or, or um, greens that they're growing um, are running low in the market. Um, simple technology, but before it was harvest your crops, take them to market and get what you can get. And maybe everybody's showing up at the same time with the same crop and just thus driving down the cost. So even the simplest technologies um, can be used to improve outcomes both for farmers and for um, uh, for the for the end user customer in in places like that. So back to the global north. Thanks for those comments about global south. Um, in the global north, we have a lot of utilities, uh, both on the energy and the water side, who are providing services to those end users, whether they're ranchers or farmers or those who supply goods and services to ranchers and farmers, um, in, including ag processors, of course. So wh where, where, where do you think uh, those utilities are going to play a useful role? Maybe they already are, and you can talk about you know, the role that uh, a utility can play or is playing in a particular location like the Russell, the Russell farm that you described at UC Davis. Uh, but I, I think if I remember correctly, UC Davis provides their own utility services to themselves because they're such a large campus. But maybe stepping back from any particular story of a particular place, you have any thoughts to reflect on about the role of a utility that's already organized and already providing services, but maybe not in a connected manner? Um, now, are, are you talking about, is, is this specific to energy utility? Or, or water utility. In other words, because you have a farmer or a rancher who already buys services, whether it's water delivered to the farm by a utility or the energy delivered to a farm and a ranch by a utility. Uh, is there a role that you think utilities are going to play or maybe are starting to already play in providing connected solutions that are m more than just the standard utility solution? Yeah, I think, I think that there's um, w what I see happening in the, in the broader ecosystem, and I, I won't pretend to be an expert 
on uh, water or energy sides of the utility. And and <laughs> to be to be uh, perfectly frank, uh, we we in the communications industry are trying to move away from that moniker of utility because of all the all the things that are associated with that. Um, but uh, there there is a very complicated uh, system of water rights, as you know, in in my home state, California, um, and that that really constrains a lot of what the utilities, um, the water utilities, uh, can and do in terms of um, allocating their their resources to farms and to to place yeah to farms and ranches um, in terms of the benefits of of uh, technology and and aiding the the better you know the more efficient um, processes of getting that 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 water those resources to um, to those farms, it absolutely um, is is a, a benefit, and it's something that they are looking at. Um, water diversion uh, requirements to measure uh, water diversion and um, groundwater um, are all going to influence the need to have uh, technology in this nexus. And um, I, I'd encourage the the person who asked that question also to look up. Uh, powwow energy and, and uh, what they're doing to monitor the energy used for pumps and and going expanding beyond um, that that technological application to um, u energy usage through throughout the farm and the whole water energy nexus um, in growing operations and then feeding that information uh, back to the utility providing either the energy or water as well as uh, giving the end user more information. And that's a place um, uh, where you could create uh, a data communities where people can start to benefit, uh, different users can start to benefit from the usage patterns and the usage data from uh, broader co um, collectives um, so, that, so that you'd have the, um, the water district uh, has a has a data set. Uh, companies like Powwow or companies that provide um, service to to the pumps and energy to the pumps has a data set. The growers or the producers or the ranchers they have a data set, and that and that data anonymized and aggregated in an environment like such as uh, shameless plug as AT and T's uh, Indigo platform would allow those data communities to share data and get information that would help them make better decisions and understand where their pain points are, uh, common pain points, or where they're out on, on the edge of the, of, of the curve in terms of their either water or energy consumption. Great, that, that helps quite a bit. And uh, we've had a question uh, about where the technology you think is the most advanced, that is commercial technology that's available today, for instance, uh, in measuring you know, water uh, availability and the moisture content in a particular location on a particular farm, uh, looking, looking at the spectrum of different technologies that are available from you know, sensors that sense the atmosphere to sensors that sense uh, the precipitation level and the moisture level to sensors that uh, are doing other functions. Is there an area where you think the innovation has been the most advanced where you would want to call out the, you know, the progress that's being made that perhaps others who are listening can, can uh, do some research on and learn from. Uh, we'd like to be able to point them in the direction of things that may be in the commercial environment are already available that represent real innovation. Um, I, I, I will, I'll highlight a couple of companies that I've looked at recently in the, in that area of um, soil and moisture sensing, but I'll tell you, uh, where I believe that the innovation, uh, some of the best innovation taking place are uh, 
is in the universities, um, such as, uh, you know, I've, I've already mentioned Davis and uh, CSU Fresno and the institutes that are associated with those, those universities. Um, so the Institute for Irrigation Technology at CSU Fresno, the wet center there, and then um, the World Food Center um, at, at, um, at UC Davis. Uh, there in, and in their ag schools, you are going to see a lot of groundbreaking technology, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, <laughs> in, in soil moisture sensing. And then you're also going to um, see where they're seeding the future uh, technologists that come out of the university um, and maybe meet the person coming off the farm and, and getting together and saying, hey, there, there might be a better way to do this and make this commercially viable. Um, and then some of those, some of the companies that I've seen coming out of these uh, incubators um, that started out in the university programs potentially um, are, are like Arable, a company I was just recently introduced to, a, a very sleek form factor. Uh, the designer of that, of, of their sensor, um, worked on the GoPro camera. And so that you can get a sense of, of how, they're, how they're kind of combining uh, different technologies as well as form factors to make something that's um, durable. Uh, Waterbit is another company that uh, I've had exposure to, seen at a couple of conferences. Their, their CEO uh, is a very um, forward-thinking uh, individual that has developed a uh, an end-to-end -end technology, and that's an important thing about uh, any of these soil um, or moisture sensors or things you're going to put in the field. They're going to have to be durable, first of all. Second of all, they're also going to have to be uh, connectable. And what I mean by that is if, if, if it requires a wire to the sensor, there's a lot of points of failure along that, that wire to the sensor, so you want it to be wireless. Um, if it's going to be wireless, then it has to work on some protocol. And you mentioned uh, LoRa. There's some uh, proprietary um, uh, protocols like Sigfox. There's uh, LTE-M uh, based on CAT M1 technology that AT&T has, has developed and used. And each of those protocols requires uh, a different type of uh technology to pass that data from that sensor to a gateway and if it's going to be wireless it's also going to have to have some form of power and that's going to be uh, a small solar chip that's going to provide enough power for that sensor then it's going to have to transmit data either intermittently or um or it's going to have to cache data so that so the sensor has to be designed so that it can work optimally under the conditions that the particular grower needs, as well as be able to collect the important data of, you know, whether it's weather um, or ambient temperature data, um, moisture in the soil, uh, nutrient content, et cetera. Well, what we've learned from the smart city universe, and I think it applies here in the smart rural universe, is that there's a key role that needs to be filled for integration. As you just described it, there are many moving parts. There's data flowing up and down the spectrum. There's securing that data. There's storing and analyzing that data, sometimes analyzing in real time and not just analyzing the historical footprint of the data and so forth and so on. And so my question about the farmer or the rancher is, you know, he or she is looking at this opportunity and recognizes the value, recognizes there's multiple sources of value, one of which is reducing cost, uh, reducing operating expenses, uh, increasing efficiency, increasing productivity, maybe even discovering new revenue streams. But the reality is that the farmer and the rancher, he or she has already got their hands full. So is there a role that somebody like AT&T is going to play, or perhaps it's a different type of organization, to bring the different pieces of the puzzle together and provide a one-stop shopping soup to nuts, end to end solution, or is that not likely to happen in the near term? Where, where are you seeing the prospects for that kind of a role to be played as integrator? 
Yeah, it's, it's uh, I think you're first going to see that in, in larger operations where internally a, a company, you know, say the size of a Gallo or Jackson family can um, have a person in their organization that has that end to end view from operations and technology um, to, to even distribution. And they're looking at the whole value chain and that, that individual will probably reside out of outside of the IT organization, but obviously work very closely with it and be able to make uh, decisions. Um, in terms of uh, companies uh, that provide the connectivity um, and bring in other players, uh, I do see partnerships between um, big, big, uh, larger companies that can provide um, the connectivity for the farms and the ranches and also bring in vendors that do the sensing and and the work on the on the production side to automate the farm uh, and then and then also work on the other end of the supply chain to um, bring together vendors and partners and professional services that can tell the farmer how they're how they're not just their crop but the data from their their growing operation can be used to improve outcomes and also contribute to these data communities that that can then get give them um, even more of an understanding of how they they kind of fit into the whole value chain and how they can provide food even potentially on demand to customers, individual customers in the city or a suburban environment. That That's a lot to take in and a lot to process. So there are going to have to be uh, third parties and mediators to help broker these relationships until we get to technology to the point where, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's able to, to put more control into the hands of, the, the farmers and ranchers in, in a very easy point and click fashion or however that will work. Maybe even machine to machine automated and there doesn't have to be that much communication. So you're advocating that the robots should take over our farms and then they can leave us alone. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, we're, we're, we're coming toward the top of the hour and I want to make sure to address a few of the other questions that have come in. Uh, one question is about the role that NGOs can play like Charity Water. Uh, they're playing an interesting role in not just installing water pumps in distressed communities, mostly rural communities, uh, to give people access to clean water, but they're, they're using sensors and installing sensors around those water pumps to enable you know, remote management of the asset. Um, and this kind of remote sensing of the performance of something like a water pump can dramatically reduce the inefficient use of the farm hand uh, or the ranch hand who has to go and check to see whether these things are performing well. So that's a sort of simple benefit from a remote sensing capacity. Uh, do, do you see you know, these assets on the farm like the water pump or the pipes or the equipment or the stored whatever, the stored fertilizer. Is this an area that's already been pretty well addressed by the emerging innovations that asset performance, the tracking of the asset, the monitoring of the asset, whatever that physical unit of, of, of concern is like a water pump. Are we pretty, pretty far along in the process of getting that piece of the puzzle in place? And are the technologies now available? Yeah, um, I, I would say that uh, what, what I see a lot of is that there are companies out there that started out looking at the efficiency of, of water pumps or coming up with a better mousetrap in terms of a sensor technology or evapotranspiration. Um, and, and everything in between. Um, we, we've known that the um, smart tractor, if you will, uh, automated steering and GPS technology to guide, um, guide the, the combines and the big machines that are out there uh, in the Midwest scenario. Th those things have been out there for, for quite a long time. And, um, and so 
it, it is fair to say that the market is pretty mature from the perspective of those individual devices and individual applications. But the integration into a, a dashboard that can take in all of that data, process that data, and give, you know, maybe in the cloud, and then give that information or maybe localized cache data, uh, and then give meaningful information about decisions and real-time um, operations, that isn't there yet. Um, and if that's an individual doing it, as, as, we, as we say, like, like call that the, you know, 1.0, what about the advancing to the 3.0 where, uh, as you speculated, machines are just doing all of this, the machine-to-machine -machine communications that I talked about, the 13.7 billion connections uh, that Cisco um, prognosticates will be uh, uh, occurring by 2021. Um, a lot of that would be the next stage of advancement so that those decisions um, are, are made by and you know intelligent um, artificial intelligence and the machines themselves are talking to each other making those decisions making those adjustments and then the human interface becomes less and less and growers can concentrate on on, on other focus on other things which uh, is are important aspects of their business that can't be automated one of the things we're going to focus on in that regard during the Meeting of the Minds program that you'll be joining us for in Cleveland on October 23, 24, 25, is we're going to look at the financing aspect of this. How banks uh, like one of the sponsors, Wells Fargo Bank, or how the large constructors and engineers who play a key role like Black & Beach, or how their advisors like Deloitte, how those companies are working together uh, particularly to enable financeable projects to emerge because this this challenge of taking a farm or a ranch uh, or any project, even an urban project, and turning it from a good idea to something that can be financed, that's bankable, uh, that has and represents essentially the prospect for success. Uh, this is not easy. You have to have a lot of different hands involved in the kitchen to prepare that kind of a meal that's successful at the end. And I guess, you know, in the last two minutes that we have, uh, I'm wondering if you could give us, you know, your assessment for the prospects that we will get our, our act together, you know, and, and see smart farming and smart ranching emerge as um, a viable business, not just a nice science experiment, but that these technologies are, are replicable in other places beyond the, beyond the points where they now succeed, uh, that they can be scaled from small to, to large. Uh, and that they can be transferred from global north to global south. Do you you want to give us in the, the last two minutes your uh, your wrap up assessment of of how well we're doing and where you think we might be either optimistically or pessimistically in the coming years? Uh, well, one one sign that uh, we're heading in the direction of greater and greater adoption, uh, Gordon. If you remember back to twenty fourteen. Uh, when when we did uh, our, our uh, maiden voyage in, into this, and, and, and we were talking about it even its earliest 2013 um, into precision agriculture, um, we were looking at well-established players um, that were like Valmont Irrigation uh, with the big center pivot operation, uh, and automating uh, some of the aspects of, of the existing technology and infrastructure for large-scale uh, irrigation. And, and that's great. And the discussions we were having were, were good discussions. Um, but that was, you know, four years ago, that the inception of that discussion. And look how much has changed since then. We're talking about the Internet of Things and machine-to-machine -machine technology and artificial intelligence and the cloud becoming part of the part of the discussion on the finance end. We see um, uh, family offices and uh, angel investors and venture capital and large uh, banks like Rabobank coming in and and funding um, the technology, the technological side. Um, farmers and and growers live season to season, and they rely on loans to get. 
um, the seed and the fertilizer and the things they need to get the, the next crop the next year. And then they need loans again and they have expensive equipment to buy. If we're talking now about ways to drive efficiencies and invest in technology that will lead to greater productivity and reduce resources, resource requirements, connect growers in the, in the rural area to, um, the, the, to the demand in, in the cities um, virtually and, and intelligently and automatically, um, and then make those operations uh, hyper-efficient and reduce um, some of the transportation requirements by having not just uh, rely, reliance on uh, urban, uh, rural farms, but also um, urban farms and vertical farms and transporting that technology and the intelligence and the networks to the global south and other places where the, de the demand isn't just for um, foodies that want a, a new experience and fresher food, but people who might be starving in a place where, you know, people don't know that they're, that they're starving or there's a crop that can be grown um, there if, if they had the right tools and the right, um, you know, irrigation technologies, they could grow something in some place where they, they can't grow it today. Uh, I, I can see all of that advancing um, since we had we started our first discussions four years ago and I think four years from now um, if we keep on the pace that we're going um, we'll see a lot more investment we'll see a lot more improvements and outcomes and hopefully a lot more uh, healthier um, happier people uh, around the world as we move toward uh, 9 billion population in 2050. Well, on that optimistic note, because it is optimism that I share, I'll, I'll say thanks to you, John Jefferson, for joining us from AT&T. Thanks to Sylvia and the team at the World Smart City Forum. Uh, this has been really helpful for us all to be able to reflect on how this technology that we've talked about uh, not just affects the urban farm, uh, but the, the rural communities that we depend upon in our cities. And we're, we're excited that we had participants join us with lots of good questions. John, this uh, video will be available to everybody on YouTube. So be prepared for comments and questions in the, in the months and years ahead. And we'll, we'll be tracking progress on this. And uh, hopefully we'll have at least one guest blog post in the coming months on the World Smart City Forum website to lay out some of these ideas in, in text and, and not just orally. So again, thanks to you, John. We're signing off and we welcome a chance to keep the conversation moving forward. Good day to everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, everyone.